In all instances, genes and environment interact to lead to protein production, which then leads to behaviors and phenotypes out here. It is impossible to pull the two apart. Hello everybody and welcome to this week's From Theory to Practice where I take a look at the research so you don't have to. Now we're going to do something special for the next set of videos. We're going to take a look at a single question, in this case the nature versus nurture debate. There are several new books about to be published looking at genetics, so I think this is an important topic and something we should dive into. So the first relevant article I've chosen to take a look at is called Effects of Enriched and Restricted Early Environments on the Learning Ability of Bright and Dull Rats by Cooper and Zubek. Now to understand this paper, we've got to come to terms with one somewhat surprising idea, and it's this. Genes do not work the way most people think they do. So simply put, every human being has a set of DNA. And this DNA can be divided into unique sections that code for proteins. And we call these different sections genes. And it's commonly believed that one gene codes for one protein. This is why many people refer to genetics as being a blueprint. Whatever genes you got, that's gonna build a set of proteins, that's gonna build you. In fact, George Beadle and Edward Tatum won the Nobel Prize in 1958 for this exact idea. One gene equals one protein. And when asked how many genes then are required to build a human body, Beadle and Tatum estimated about 100,000. So jump ahead now to the year 2000 when scientists finally completed the Human Genome Project, a project that set out to map all of these genes. And what did this project find? Turns out human beings don't have 100,000 protein coding genes. They estimated we only have about 30,000. And by 2004, when the data was a bit clearer, that estimate dropped to 25,000. And by 2007, it dropped to 22,000. And today we estimate human beings only have about 19,000 protein coding genes in our body. And just to put this into context, a simple nematode worm has about 20,000 protein coding genes. So it turns out it can't be as simple as one gene equals one protein. And in fact, we now know that's not even close. It turns out most genes can code for multiple, often very different proteins based upon the cellular environment that gene finds itself in. Now, as a couple of extreme examples, there is a gene in fruit flies called DSCAM, which due to different environments can code for 38,000 different proteins. And closer to home, human beings have a gene called BCLX, which again, depending on environment, will code for a protein that either leads a cell to kill itself or a protein that leads a cell to protect itself against death. Completely opposing outcomes, both coming from the same exact gene. In fact, we now estimate that 79% of human protein coding genes code for two or more non-overlapping proteins. So genes aren't a one-to-one -one endeavor. And in fact, from the very moment genes are formed, they begin interacting, taking cues from the environment to determine what function they're going to undertake. So at the most basic level, we already see an interaction between nature and nurture. But more importantly is here. So one gene can code for many proteins depending on environment. But what this means is different genes can code for the same protein based on environment. And that's where this paper comes in. Now in animal research, we breed different strains of rats for different purposes. And two specific strains of rat we have bred are called bright and dull. And as you can guess, bright rats have been specifically bred to learn how to run mazes better than any other strain of rat. Meanwhile, dull rats learn mazes very poorly and make more mistakes than any other rat. In fact, all things being equal, dull rats on average make about 164 mistakes when learning a new maze, while bright rats only make 117 mistakes. So a clear bred genetic difference. Now the researchers in this paper wanted to see how might the environment influence this? So what they did is they took both strains of rats and they raised one set in a really impoverished environment where they had no access to toys or other rats and the other group in an enriched environment where they had access to a ton of toys and they were able to be social and interact with other animals. And they wanted to see even in these animals specifically bred for these purposes, can environment play a role? And what did they find? They found that dull rats in the impoverished environment made about 169 errors learning a new maze. Meanwhile, bright rats made about 169 errors, exactly the same. So the environment was able to feed back and start to change genetic expression, the proteins being made, to impact behavioral outcomes. 
But let's flip it. What about the enriched environment? Dull rats in an enriched environment made only about 119 errors, whilst bright rats made about 112. So again, the environment fed back and started to change genetic expression in a very meaningful way. So this paper is a very powerful example of how genes themselves don't really do much. They have to interact with an environment to determine what proteins they're gonna make to determine what outcomes we get. Now, before moving on, it's worth pointing out that a lot of people read this research and they think, well, it looks like environment is everything. And here you see, no, it's an interplay between genetics and environment. So go back, whether the dull rats were in a normal environment or an impoverished environment didn't matter. Those two different environments had the same impact on genetic expression. It was only the enriched environment that changed expression. However, in the bright rat, the enriched environment didn't change expression at all. In this instance, it was the impoverished environment that changed genetic expression. In all instances, genes and environment interact to lead to protein production, which then leads to behaviors and phenotypes out here. It is impossible to pull the two apart. One of the best illustrations of this I've ever seen is this simple cartoon here. If Janie and Johnny are both pouring water into a bucket, we can suss out who's contributing what. So for instance, if Janie has a bigger hose, we can say 75% of the water in that bucket was due to Janie, 25 was due to Johnny. And this is how most people discuss genes. How much is genes, how much is environment? But once you see the two can't be separated, this forms a different image. In this cartoon, Johnny turns on the hose and Janie uses it to fill the bucket. In this scenario, what percentage of water in the bucket is due to Janie and which is due to Johnny? It's an irrelevant and unanswerable question. You can't parse it in that way. Eliminate either child and you get zero water in the bucket. So all this is well and good when we're talking about rats, but what does it look like with humans? In the next video, that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna see how this nature-nurture intertwine impacts student outcomes in the classroom. So I hope you're all well. Thank you so much for watching and I look forward to seeing you next video where we'll go deeper into this topic. Bye y'all.